Good morning. It's a real pleasure to be here. First of all, I wanted to thank Dr. Ayamani, who has organized this truly visionary conference, and the organizers for putting it together and having me here. So thank you, and I hope for lots of interactions, and I encourage you to talk with me in the break, since I really feel that communication is really the, the best part to success in the end that will benefit children and families with adults. I have no conflict of interest, and as you can tell by my accent, I'm from Germany. When I was a child growing up in Germany, the book that was read the most to me was Der Struvelpeter. I'm not sure whether this is familiar here. It was translated by Mark Twain into English, and Der Struvelpeter, or Slovenly Peter, was written by a German physician, 1845, and his name is Dr. Heinrich Hoffmann. He was sick and tired of having storybooks where every story was sweet and had a beautiful ending because he had a son who was very active, so he wanted to have stories that would appeal to him. So there's one story, and that's a story of Fidgety Philip. And let me just read you the first part here. So this is a nice family that you can see here, nice upper German class family. Let me see if Philip can be a little gentleman. Let me see if he is able to sit still for once at table, thus spoke in earnest tone the father to his son, and the mother looked very grave to see Philip so misbehave. I wanted to point out two things. When you use DSM-4 criteria, you find that uh, Philip, not surprisingly, has the hyperactive type of ADHD. The part as a geneticist that I wanted to point out, uh, and I, I will do this to my left here, that this father, in Germany it's not usual to drink wine for dinner, that may be common in France, but not in, in Germany. So I wanted to point out two things. The father having wine may point to that he has a problem with alcohol, and the other part that you can see is that's not the way to hold your knife in Germany, so he may have some problems with anger management. So as one of the comorbidities. And here you see the problems that happen to little Philip here, that it's really a burden on the family. Let me tell you just another brief story here. This is a story of Johnny had an ear. As he trudged, trudged along to school, it was always Johnny's rule to be looking at the sky and the clouds that floated by. But what just before him lay in his way, Johnny never thought about so that everyone cried out, look at little Johnny there, little Johnny had an ear. So there's quite some teasing going on with children who have, as in this case, the inattentive type of ADHD. And as you can see here, another story that doesn't end well. Uh, uh, fortunately, the ending is he only loses his school book, but at least he is safe. So, so much of an introduction when I was exposed to learning about ADHD, and that was as a three-year-old, and I knew this book by heart, wonderful stories. I really call it the Bible for child psychiatrists. It has stories where children play with fire, where children suck their thumbs, and where there are various behavioral differences. So if you want to read what's wrong with children in Germany, go pick up this book here. So. I'm a geneticist, so I will focus on the genetics of ADHD, but the point that I want to make is that the causes of ADHD are poorly understood, but what we are, we are beginning to now understand ADHD better and better, and what has become clear is that ADHD has a number of causes, and these causes are environmental, they are genetics, and most of all, and that I find the most important part, are the interactions between environmental causes and genes. As a geneticist, I love twin studies, and there are multiple studies that you can see here, and even though this may look like a complicated slide, I will guide you through it, and you will understand it from start to finish. As you can see here, each of these double bars is an individual study here, and what these bars mean in blue, those are uh, monozygotic twins, and as you all know, monozygotic twins are those twins who have the identical genetic material born at the same time, whereas dizygotic twins, shown here in red or in orange, are those twins 
who are as related as siblings are, so their genes are about 25% uh, in common, and those are children born at the same time. When you look at approximately, and, and here you find this confirmed in every single study, when you look at this study, for example, when you look here, you find that if 100 twin pairs are born that are monozygotic twins, where that means both of them have identical genetic material, that if one twin has ADHD, then only 70 of the other twins will have ADHD, so 30 don't. And what that is telling us as a geneticist, that even though the genetic material is identical, that not the phenotype is not identical in all cases, meaning that, as Dr. Swanson uh, told you beforehand, that there's a major genetic component to it. And this study, for example, would suggest that the heritability is 70% and that the environmental effects are 30%. And this is intriguing when you compare this to dizygotic twins, where if one twin has ADHD, then out of 100 twin pairs, only 25 of the other twins would have ADHD. And so this, in essence, would uh, correspond to the recurrence rate in families. If one child has ADHD, there's a 25% chance for the next child to have ADHD. As a geneticist, I can tell you the more individuals in a nuclear family are affected, the, more, the higher the risk of having ADHD in the next family. So for example, if both mother and father have ADHD, the risk is as high as 50% and higher. And I will tell you more about that, but I'm intrigued by the fact that numerous studies come up with similar results that, con that show there is a a quite substantial contribution of genetics to ADHD, but as you will hear in the following talk by Dr. Lanfer, there is an uh, equally uh, important contribution of the environment and of environmental factors in interacting with genes. Just to show you other studies where the inheritance pattern is not quite clear, and these studies have been done in a similar way as have, uh, based on twin studies, as have done other studies. So most people probably would think that breast cancer would be almost exclusively genetics, and you can tell there's a contribution of only about 25% is genetics, where 75% is environment. Not surprisingly, asthma has a genetic component, but clearly the environmental component is outweighing the genetic component. In contrast, schizophrenia and ADHD have a large genetic component and a somewhat smaller environmental component and only height, which is about 90% determined by uh, genetics, but then again determined about 10% by nutrition and other environmental factors. So as a geneticist, twin studies like these are a wonderful way of looking at are genetic factors contributing to the etiology of what we call a complex genetic disorder where this is not a Mendelian disorder where there is either a 50% inherence uh, recurrence risk or an autosomal recessive disorder where there is a 25% recurrence risk. Dr. Swanson talked about genetic approaches to ADHD and let me, let me amplify on that just ever so briefly. There are, of course, uh, as uh, Jim talked about, there are candidate gene approaches, and I will tell you just a little bit about that more. Genome-wide scans, fine mapping of linked regions, gene identification, and the one that you can't read here, you'll be able to read in just a moment, is genome-wide association studies. Let me guide you through those and let me tell you what I think are the best studies that will help us understand ADHD in this, uh, in this year. So candidate gene, approach, uh, candidate gene approaches have been done for a number of times and, and Jim's study and other studies uh, have been on the forefront of studying candidate genes in ADHD. In order to, un to, to look at candidate genes, you have to have some understanding of areas of the brain and genes that might be involved in ADHD. 
And as you have heard just in the previous talk, in Jim's talk, you know that genes such as dopamine transporter are important for reuptake of dopamine, that the receptor, the best studied gene here, dopamine receptor D4, DRD4, have been candidate genes that have been studied for quite some time. And numerous studies have, sh have shown that indeed some, several of those candidate genes increase the risk for having ADHD if you have a specific SNP, a specific genetic set of these candidate genes. Another study that Jim alluded to is genome-wide association studies. So these are studies where you look at, for example, a thousand individuals that have ADHD, and you look at controls where the, for example, a thousand individuals who do not have ADHD. When you do this, this is quite an expensive undertaking, and what you will what people, ha people have done these studies, and they have been done by multi-center studies, and I will show you the same slide that Jim showed you. This is a, the first report of a genome-wide association scan of attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, which was done by Steve Ferron's group, and what they find is none of the genetic association tests achieved genome-wide significance. So at this point, even though I do not want to dismiss genome-wide association studies for the future, at this point, they have not uh, brought the successes that we had hoped it would do. Let me tell you about approaches that have been successful, and these include genome-wide scans, fine mapping of linked regions. Those have actually led to gene identification at this point. So let me focus now on two different approaches, one where you look at small pedigrees and another one where you look at large pedigrees. And I can tell you advantages and disadvantages, and not surprisingly, even though I haven't said that, I think it's safe to assume that there isn't just one ADHD gene out there, but probably four or five major genes, and then I'm guessing maybe some 40 to 50 minor genes that contribute to ADHD. So the disadvantages, let me start with those. When we look at small pedigrees, one would assume since there are many genes involved that there's genetic heterogeneity. And as you know, heterogeneity means different genes contribute. So in order to have any information about those, you need a large sample set if you have small families. And with small families, I mean just having two siblings and parents where possibly you don't know whether they are affected or not. The disadvantages of large families is something that I didn't know beforehand, and that is in genetic terms called bilineality. So many times when there is a family with ADHD who has a child with ADHD, that both parents are affected. So for example, here you see both parents in this pedigree have ADHD and the child has ADHD as well. When we did a study of large families, we found that about 80% of families that we studied have bilineality. That means that it occurs that people who have high level of activity seek out partners who have high level of activity and then may have children who have high levels of activity. The other disadvantage is it's difficult to find large pedigrees from a genetic isolate. For a geneticist, it's really ideal to study families where either where people come from a large lineage where they have been amongst themselves. So that would be considered a genetic isolate. In Europe, probably the best known genetic isolate is Finland, because the Finnish have been together for some four, have, have been together for some 5,000 years, had several bottlenecks, and so there's, they are somewhat of a homogeneous population. So finding genetic isolates is extremely helpful in studying the genetics of complex traits such as ADHD. What are the, what are the ad advantages of ADHD? So if you have about 1,000 families of this type here, the statistical power is relatively high. If you collect large families like this one here, the advantage is that you have less 
heterogeneity, but you may assume that in one family there's only one gene contributing to ADHD, or maybe two genes, and possibly you could find out about patterns of segregation. So when you look at this pedigree, for example, you could assume maybe this is a pedigree with autosomal dominant inheritance, where there is a high recurrence risk with reduced penetrance. So what we decided we wanted to do both, we felt that by looking at small pedigrees and large pedigrees, that this might help identifying genes that contribute to ADHD. And this is what I'm going to tell you over the next few minutes over the rest of my talk. The population isolate that we have studied is an isolate that lives in South America, in Colombia, between the Central and Western Andes. They live here in this valley, whoops, I'm sorry, in this valley, in the Eastern Andes and the, uh, and the Central Andes. And they, are, they call themselves the Paisas of Antioquia. So they have large families. They came 400 years ago from Spain and they have, in essence, intermarried. So out of 30 families that started out 400 years ago, there are now a total of 5 million people. I have to tell you, for a geneticist, this is a dream come true. It couldn't get any better. People who have large families, who, have, who marry amongst themselves, this is truly, for a geneticist, you are able to identify genes in these large families. So, when you look at a real family here, this is not computer generated, we find when we do detailed phenotyping studies, and I have to tell you, those are really the most important studies. It's not the genetic studies, but it's the clinical studies to define the phenotype in all aspects here. We find that these individuals with the red dots in here have ADHD and some don't quite have fulfilled all of the DSM-4 criteria, but have almost ADHD. And when we look for comorbid disorders, we find that a number of them who have ADHD have conduct disorders, other have, as you can see here, have oppositional defiant disorders. And interestingly, in a large family like this, you find individuals who have conduct disorder and oppositional defiant disorder even without ADHD. And of course, not surprisingly, there are additional comor uh, comorbid associations, and those include alcohol dependence, as you see here, and nicotine dependence. So those are, of course, only in the adult generations. You won't, you won't find many children who smoke or drink. But this would be a typical pedigree in the Pisces, uh, of the Pisces in Antioquia. So when we do a genome-wide study, and I will be happy to tell you about how you do this in real life and really in the laboratory, what you do need is you need a blood sample on every person affected and unaffected, what you can do, you can do genetic studies, and what you find is, you find that in a family like this, which is another large real family, you find that just one family by itself is enough, what we call, to find a significant lot score. So what we find is, we find a region in the genome, here it happens to be family number, that we call family number eight, and we find one region in the genome on chromosome 11 where we find an almost significant lot score. What this means is, it means that in this region, there's a gene located on chromosome 11 that contributes to these individuals having ADHD. So this was, for us, fantastic. This is what we were hoping for. And we were quite surprised when we saw, when we looked at another large family like this one here, from the same genetic isolate that we find, this is family nine here, and again the data for family nine, where we find a significant lot score of chromosome eight, suggesting that individuals who have ADHD have ADHD because they have it due to a gene on chromosome eight, but to our surprise we find that there's a second gene at work and contributing to ADHD in this family, and this is a gene on chromosome four. So, what we find already in a genetic isolate where we thought there would be decreased genetic heterogeneity, we find that even though in most families one gene is at work, there are some families where two genes are major contributors to ADHD. So let me now focus, let me show you, as we had predicted, there would be some five genes or five regions in the genome on chromosomes four, 
5, 8, 11, and 17. And for the remainder of the talk, let me only focus on the gene on chromosome 4. So again, just going directly to fine mapping and where we get there. And this is something that Jim told you about. We, this is a paper that has been submitted now. And by doing fine mapping and comparing the families, what do they have in common? We find the only thing that is an overlap in all of the linked families is one gene. And this gene is called latrophilin-3. Let me tell you a little bit about latrophilin-3. So this is currently the gene that, as we, as we understand it, is the gene that contributes the most to the genetics of ADHD. Latrophilin-3 is a receptor gene. It happens to be a G-protein coupled receptor. And what this means is, this is a cell membrane here. This is inside of the cell at the bottom here. At the top, that's outside of the cell. So a receptor protein is a protein that, has, uh, that can receive information that binds to the receptor and transfer this information via the transmembrane domain to the inside of the cell. And this is actually in common with dopamine receptor 4 and dopamine receptor D5, which are also G-protein coupled receptor, receptors. Latrophilin 3 is a gene that has very poorly been studied. However, the relatives, latrophilin 1 and 2, have been studied, and they are genes that are known receptors for alpha latrotoxin. That's also called black widow spider venom, and that stimulates exocytosis of GABA containing, containing presynaptic vesicles. And so this would actually fit quite nicely with ADHD, and then not surprisingly, when we, did, uh, when we measured where is this gene expressed, it's very little expressed in the, red, the rest of the body. It's mostly expressed in the brain, and within the brain it's expressed in the me mesolimbic system, in brain regions of the mesolimbic system, and as you know, those are associated with ADHD. So it all fits nicely together. I wanted to see, is this just a gene that's important in the PISAs, and that would be, of course, of interest for the PISAs, but I wanted to see, did we find any association in the US families that we had collected at the NIH, and in a collaboration with Klaus-Peter Lesch in Germany, is there any correlation there? And the answer is yes, we were quite surprised that individuals who are as diverse, as heterogeneous as the, as the US population, and a little less heterogeneous as the German population, we find that in all of those families, latrophilin-3 has a significant association with ADHD. We didn't let loose then, but we felt we wanted to look at more families, and we did that. We expanded studies at in, uh, in Philadelphia, we looked at families from Spain, from Norway. In the end, we looked at close to 6,500 individuals from 1,400 families. And I can tell you that all of those families from very diverse backgrounds demonstrate that latrophilin-3 is associated with ADHD. So let me guide you through a slide that comes now and that may look complicated, and I can promise you when you leave here, you, can, you, will, you will be able to explain this to your friends. Maybe you'll just take a deep breath right now to just flood your brain with oxygen, and then I'll guide you through this slide here. So when you look at this slide, and this was, these are data taken from the PISAs, for a moment just focus on this red bar here, and these are base pairs in the gene for latrophilin-3 at different positions. When we look in the PISAs, we find that we call, can call this the susceptibility haplotype that is seen that has a relative risk of 4.3. So if you have this haplotype, the susceptibility haplotype, your relative risk of developing ADHD is 4.3 times higher than if you have what, I, what we call the protective haplotype, which is this one here. The distinction between susceptibility haplotype and protective haplotype is of importance for what I want to show you now. And this same haplotype where the same gene has either one way 
of base pair changes in there versus another base pair change there was also shown in all of the other populations that I showed you beforehand. So when we look at individuals who have either the susceptibility haplotype or who have the protective haplotype, we did a study called uh, where we, we did a metabolic brain analysis where we used proton magnetic resonance spectroscopy, or 1H MRS. And 1H MRS has been around for a little while, and this is a study that does not use, uh, that does no, not use radiation, but it provides an index of neuronal number, metabolism, or brain viability. This ratio here, N-acetyl aspartate over creatinine ratio, is decreased in individuals with ADHD. And this is something that has been known for a quite some time. This is not our work, but this is done by other studies. When we look at individuals, we looked at individuals who either have one copy or two copies of the susceptibility haplotype, who have at least one copy or two copies of the protective haplotype, and then we look at individuals who have a different genotype. And when we do this and look at specific regions that are involved in brain, uh, that are involved in ADHD, if we just focus here for a moment just on the right thalamus, we find that in individuals who have two susceptibility haplotypes, their N-acetyl aspartate over creatinine ratio is lower than in individuals who have two copy, copies of the protective haplotype, or when you compare this to controls. So the ratio of N-acetyl over uh, aspartate over creatinine varies inversely with the number of ADHD susceptibility alleles, making some sense of why individuals with ADHD, or some individuals with uh, this specific haplotype indeed have ADHD, as was shown previously. Let me tell you, this is my last slide now, uh, let me tell you that we use this same study and using the, the uh, test that was developed by Dr. Jim Swanson, where he used measures where he didn't, and again, I promise you, you will understand this slide as soon as I guide you through this, where he used measures for one, uh, this would be item one of the hyperactive type, item two of the hyperactive type, and so on. And this is here before medication, and this is with medication. And what you find is, you find individuals, you find those at different lines here, and you see that some individuals who have the, for example, who have this type here, who have a, both a combined, for example, this orangish red line, who have a combined type, you find that these are individuals who, after medication, respond quite nicely to the stimulant medication. In contrast, there are other individuals who don't respond that well to medication. When we did a comparative study, when we looked at those individuals who respond to medication versus those individuals who do not respond to medication, we were able to correlate this with a susceptibility haplotype with a genetic variance in the gene for LPHN3. So this is a study where the genotype, where the genetic studies predict whether a person is likely to respond to stimulant medication or not. And I would say, I'm quite pleased to say that this may well be a first step towards personalized medicine so that we can predict in the future, not right now, right now this is a research tool, but that in the future we can predict whether someone will respond to stimulant medication or will be better off with other treatment approaches. So in summary, large families have helped identify LPHN3 as one of several genes that confer susceptibility to ADHD. At this point, LPHN3 confers the highest relative risk. Brain imaging studies have shown that, LP, that link LPHN3 to brain metabolic functions involved in ADHD, and we were pleased to find that specific changes in LPHN3 are associated with response to stimulant medication, and as I said, we're pleased also that this seems to be the first step towards personalized medicine where the genetics will aid 
in predicting response to ADHD medication. Thank you very much for your attention.